All right, then we are back uh, quarter past four. Apologize for all the uh, time delays and the mix of, of time zones, uh, etc. So, um, but uh, it's good that a lot of you wanted to stay to listen to this as well. That uh, we really appreciate it, and we appreciate you taking the time as well, Alexi. Uh, so with us, we have then Alexi Milkov from the Colorado Schools of Mines. He will give a presentation uh, called Critical Comparison of pre drill Assessments and Drilling Outcomes Using Open Source Data on Petroleum Exploration in Mexico 2018-2021. to 2021. Uh, He is a full professor and director of Potential Gas Agency at Colorado School of Mines and a consultant to the oil and gas industry. After receiving a PhD from Texas, uh, Dr. Milko worked for BP, Sisol, and Murphy Oil as geoscientist and senior manager. He has also explored for conventional and unconventional oil and gas in over 30 basins on six continents. So then I give you the word, Alexei. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start sharing and let me know if you can see my title slide. Yes, can you see it? Yes, I can see it. Fantastic, very good. Yes, thank you very much for staying and uh, yeah, sorry again for mix up in time, but I'll try to make it worse for you guys. So whoever stayed hopefully will benefit from this and I know you're recording, so maybe people who didn't stay, you know, will see the recording. Um, yeah, so uh, I know you talked about Norway. That's where you are and that's what your interest is. Uh, I will talk about Mexico just to give a slightly different view um, but we're going to talk about volumes and risk assessments, pre-drill and post-drill results and comparisons. And I'll make some points which I think you would be able to relate to, um, you know, with your work in Norway. So slightly different geography, but I think the principles are the same. And if not, we can chat about that. So um, key words here, I guess, is uh, open source data right and and mexico so because historically as you know petroleum exploration you know was considered to be very competitive activity and predictions and drilling outcomes uh, used to be very highly very confidential and stayed within the companies right now norway is different because in norway thanks to npd we know the results of wells uh, very quickly right and it's publicly available and that's great um but the pre-drill assessments are probably a little bit more hidden, at least for me. I, I, I can find some wells in Norway with pre-drill assessments, but not all of them, right? So there is no, uh, I, well, I know NPD has them, right? But it's not, it's not publicly available, at least to my knowledge. Now, but this, these things change, right? So recently governments realize that it's better to be more open and uh, use of social media is also playing a huge role, right? Because there are many ways uh, for companies and for governments to be more transparent in different ways. Uh, and for exploration specifically, um, we now see uh, companies and we now see governments posting pre-drill predictions online in one way or another, right? So essentially we can use open source data to learn about petroleum exploration forecasts and outcomes and to compare them, right? So in the past, it was more difficult to do. You probably know my paper on Lundin 2017, right? Because Lundin actually published the pre-drill assessments of probability of success and volumes in their financial presentations, right? But that's a rare case. Lundin was the only company doing that to full extent. And by the way, they stopped doing pub, pub, stop publishing probability of success values <laughs> at some point. So, and that's where Mexico comes uh, into the play, because what's happening in Mexico, thanks to the regulator, right, called NH, uh, NHC, uh, National Hydrocarbon Commission, they are extremely transparent now on um, presenting to the public pre-drill assessments for the upcoming wells in Mexico, all upcoming wells in Mexico, right? And they also do publish the results on their website and very quickly, right? So not next day, but like a couple months, right? 
So, and what you're looking at essentially is kind of the methodology that I used, right? So, uh, CNH has these sessions and they record them on YouTube, right? And the recording becomes available, you know, same day, essentially, it's, it's a live sessions. Now, in these live sessions, uh, very often we see slides like this one. So this is a pre-drill uh, assessment, pre-drill summary for a prospect call called uh, Bacalar um, by Petra Nas, right? And what you see is, you know, location of the well, uh, you see water depths, it's in Spanish, but you know, it's uh, easy to figure out how many targets they actually gonna drill, uh, what's, the, what's the depth of this target, what kind of fluid they expect, temperature and fluid, probability of success, right, and the expected volumes. So uh, what I do to collect the data, I essentially watch these videos and every time, you know, this type of information becomes available, I screenshot it and then put it into Excel file, right, which becomes a database of pre-drill predictions. And for now, I have about 400 of this, right, for the last three years. Now, not all of them became drilled, right? So this one is like a final prediction for the well that actually becomes drilled, right? But for some other ones, I have like leads and prospects also in the database. Now, when the wells become drilled, um, CNH publishes an Excel spreadsheet with all the drilling results. Not all the drilling results, but it was, it was discovery or not, you know, technical, commercial, how much volumes, how much, uh, what kind of fluids they found, things like that. And that I have for about 70 wells, right? So now with that, uh, I have a data set, open source data set, right? Uh, and publicly available data set on which I compare the pre-drill predictions versus drilling outcomes. Now, as a caveat, what I think they are presenting is company's data. I think these numbers all came from, from the operators, from the Petronas. So that's my assumption. I'm pretty much sure that's true, but I cannot guarantee you that, right? So I don't know what happens between when the company actually has internal assessments and then when they present them to CNH and CNH presents to the public and has a discussion. So that gap, I don't know, because I'm completely outsider, right? So I'm not insider to any of this information, right? Uh, that's kind of, you know, one of the bad things about being in academia rather than in the industry. Uh, so, but now that you understand my methodology, let's get into some of the results, right? And we'll start with, we're going to talk about volumes and risks, and we'll start with risks or assessment of geological probability of success. I know you had a session on risking yourself, right? So you're all familiar with uh, geological probability of success and what it is. Um, what you're looking at right now is distribution uh, as a box plot uh, chart of estimated probability of success values for all evaluated prospects, right? So there was about 390 of them when I was making this slide, and for the drilled prospects and wells. Now, I use the word wells and prospects, drilled wells and prospects, right? Because unfortunately, I don't know if the probability of success is for the prospects or for the wells. And if you're familiar with my work, in one of my papers last year, I clearly differentiated these two things, right? The probability of success for the well and for the prospect can be very different. Geological probability of success and economic. Uh, so I don't know what they're actually doing. Is it prospect or the well? So I'm just using them as wells and prospects as a qualifier, okay? So one thing that you see right away is, well, there is a range, right? But the average probability of success for drilled and for all is about 36%, all right? And this is very typical for the inventories in many companies. So I know there are many people from different companies on this call. If you look at your prospect inventory, all right, you probably have something around 36%. Now, I don't know that for sure, right? And I can tell you Norway it should be much more than that. We'll talk about that. Uh, but that's kind of where most inventories that comes through me, you know, in consulting or in teaching, uh, that's what people have, right? So that's a very typical number. And the problem is it's wrong number, right? So that's what we're going to talk about. Now, um, how well we assess probability of success, 
right? How well we assess probability of success. There was a conference, uh, EAG workshop uh, a few years ago in 2018. It was in person, right? So we actually met in person in Copenhagen. And um, this, this um, histogram shows a distribution of answers to the question of in assessing the chance of making a discovery, exploration teams tend to be, you know, over risk, meaning that PG or probability of success is too low, or under risk or get it about right. And many people think that we assess probability of success well, right? And uh, I actually disagree with that. And I disagreed on that on results of you know my own previous work in three different companies and of my you know paper in Lundin. But most people think that we assess probability of success well. Well, let's look at the results, right? So this is um, estimated probability of geological success, kind of similar to the previous slide. So the average was 37 percent, 36 percent, and the actual success rate for this data set is 60 percent, right? So the average pre-drill estimated probability of success 37 and the actual success rate is 60 percent. What does it mean? It means that we essentially, right, over risk our wells. So probability of success is too low for this data set in Mexico, right? Now, most people think, most people don't think that in the industry. Most people think that, or more people think that we assess and things well, probability of success wise. No. We are not. I see this over and over and over. We make more discoveries than we uh, promise to the investors, promise to the management, all right? Uh, and by we, I mean the industry, right? In this case, industry in Mexico. Now, another caveat about Mexico, right? There is about 17, 20, oh, 21 companies actually in this data set, in Mexican data set. Pemex dominates, yes, so Pemex deals about 70% of this, but, you know, there's, there's everybody else also. So, um, right, so the actual success rate is 60%, right? So, um, now, if another thing to look at is what the probability of success for the prospects that actually became discoveries and actually beca became dry. This is a very interesting piece of analysis, which almost nobody does. Uh, you probably remember that from my Lundin paper, right? So in case of discoveries, right, when before they became discoveries, when they were prospects, the average probability of success for them was 41%. And for the prospects that actually became dry, the average probability of success is 31%. So that's kind of going in the right direction, right? Because the idea is that prospects that become discoveries should have pre real higher probability of success if you do an assessment correctly, right? So ideally, you want all your prospects that became discoveries, right, to average around 100% the probability of success per drill, right? And this wants to be zero, ideally. I mean, I know it's ideal world, that, that, that's not gonna happen. But that's how forecasting works. That would indicate ideal forecasting. Now, what we have in Mexico is a difference about 10%, 10%. Is it good? Well, it's, Kind of not, right? But it's okay. If you remember Lundin paper, there was no difference, right? In Lundin paper, I demonstrated that they could not distinguish on probability of success between future discoveries and future dry holes. So in Mexico, we can do that, right? But not that well. I would prefer to, to see much larger gap. Now, funny thing is, uh, there is no industry papers talking about this and, and looking at this metric. So I'm the only one who actually looks at this stuff. So if you if you do post drill assessment in your company, right, pay attention to this parameter. It's a very interesting to watch this gap and how how big it is because it actually shows you how good you are at assessment of probability of success. One of the metrics, right? So we underestimate probability of success, right? Meaning we over risk our prospects. We make more discoveries than we promise. Um, this plot shows all the prospects, <clears throat> and this is a larger data set, right? Because it's a, it's an ongoing data set. So in this case, it's 74 wells. And this is probability of geological success. And I rank them by probability of geological success. So this is prospect with the highest probability of success, about 78%. And this is a prospect with the largest one. And I then color code them as discovery or dry hole, right? As a result, it's a very typical plot. I'm sure you've seen it before. 
Um, so this line, uh, yeah, this line is the average probability of success for all the prospects, right? So it's a 36. And this one is the actual success rate, so it's 61. So the gap between averages is huge. That's bad. Now, on the other side, if you look at two groups, this would be less risky prospects, right? So probability of success 34 or more, pretty real. And these would be more risky prospects, right? So less than 33. So on average, right, the actual success rate is 70%. So that's good, right? So on average, we actually make more discoveries among the prospects with a higher probability of success. That's a good thing. And this one on average, right, we make uh, less discoveries for the more risky groups of prospects. That's a good thing. The problem is that the gap between pre drill assessments and actual success rates for both groups is huge. In this case, it's about what? 23%. Uh, In this case, it's about another 20%. Right. So this is a huge, huge, huge gap. So what I'm saying is we over risk our prospects. We uh, we be we have been too conservative about our probability of discovering um, our ability to discover uh, new fields and as in, in the assessment of probability of success. All right. And we are very systematic about that. Now, this plot compares pre drill assessed probability of success with actual success rates for prospects in different um, risks groups, right? So these ones, for example, pre-drill were all less than 20%. There were five of them, right? So this is the riskiest ones. And these ones were between, you know, 60 and 80% probability of success pre-drill. So these are less risky ones. And this is in between. And you see that for all these groups, we significantly, uh, we find our success rate is much greater than average pre-drill probability of success. So we basically um, underestimate probability success or overestimate volumes for all prospects, right? For all prospects. Now, here's the problem. Uh, we keep doing this. We don't learn, <laughs> right? Why I'm saying this? Uh, if you compare uh, my data set from Mexico to other data sets, right, which ones are actually relevant? So this would be two published data sets, one from Norway, right? So, and this is more recent kind of uh, Norway data, but it's still at the end of last century, right? So uh, if you look at the number of the wells drilled, about 300, average pre-drill probability of success was 29, and actual success rate was 45. So the difference is 16%. We can argue about these calculations, right? But this is simple arithmetic difference, right? Now, a little bit more recent data set from Netherlands, unsure enough, show, shows also a gap, about 11%. And my data set in Mexico is, you know, even worse, right? It's about 23% difference. So my point is, you know, what we haven't learned in the last 30 years to better assess probability of success. In spite of all this, you know, technical uh, new tools and software and conversations about risking and teaching about risking, right? And all these consultants who help you to do risks, right? And all your internal processes as industry, we have not learned anything, right? And there are fundamental reasons behind it. They are in your processes, right? It's, uh, it's basically, you know, we can talk about, you know, why this happens. A lot of that is in psychology of decision making, right? And in tools that we use, right? So. My, uh, I do a lot of work to try to mitigate this, and I think the way to mitigate this is through proper use of tools rather than people judgments, right? Because as soon as we use people judgments about risks, psychology kicks in, and it's very difficult to, to fight. It's almost impossible to fight with psychology of people. It's just so engraved in them. So I would rather risk using tools and algorithms than I would use people, right? Because unfortunately, this slide demonstrates we haven't learned anything in the last 30 years on risk assessment. Now, good news is that, you know, our success rates increase, right? We find more oil and gas. Why? Well, because technology improves, right? The best technology is today. And tomorrow is going to be even better. And tomorrow is going to be better. So we can find fields. We are good at that, right? We are not good at, you know, telling uh, the risks about finding things. Right. So. Here's another thing. Uh, remember that uh, in um, 
in pre-drill presentations, right? Even on that pattern as well that I showed, there were two targets, right? So sometimes there are three, sometimes there are four, sometimes there is one. So I recorded that, and then I looked at probability of success for prospects um, for with different segments. I use segment because I use GeoX, right? So I use segment as a term, but target, right? Zone, whatever. It's basically one assessment unit. So for prospects with one segment, the probability of success on average is 38%, right? And then it drops for two segments and drops for three to five segments, right? So basically the more segments we have, the lower the probability of success pre-drill assessed. And that goes completely in the wrong direction, right? So because the more targets we have, the more segments we have, as soon as there is a little bit of independence between them, right? The probability of success should increase. Mathematically, right? And logically, that's, that's how it should work. But it doesn't. Right, so what it tells me is that people don't use the correct process for aggregation of, of segments into a prospect. Something is wrong in that process. And I, that's why I wrote that paper about aggregation last year, all right, where I actually presented how to do it and, uh, you know, uh, and what it all means. Now, on the other hand, if you look at the driven results for prospects with different segments, that's actually what happens, right? So the actual geological success rate for prospects with more segments is lower than for prospects with one segment. And that's again where psychology kicks in, right? So why people have more segments, right? Because they don't believe in the one segment, one main segment. So they try to add more stuff to it. But unfortunately, if you take, you know, three things, three bad things together, right? It doesn't become one better prospect, one better prospect. So, I mean, this is a mess in the industry, right? So, and something that people don't address address properly. And uh, as many of you know, I'm trying to help uh, with that. All right, so that's risking. Uh, now we're gonna talk about volumes, talk about volumes. And I'm gonna start with this chart, which is a bit unusual, right? Because I'm basically comparing found volumes with predicted mean success case resource volumes for both discoveries and dry holes. That's why you see lots of zeros here, right? Because all these ones actually become became dry holes, right? And that's okay. I mean, you can do whatever we, we can do with these graphs, whatever you want. Uh, this is one to one line, right? Because this is a log scale and this is arithmetic scale. Uh, but essentially everything on this side is underestimated volume spread drill and everything on this side is overestimated volume spread drill. And this is the dry uh, dry line, right? So I'm basically plotting uh, kind of all different things. And I'm also separating them between unsure, which are brown, right? By PMX, it's squares and triangles is other operators and offshore um, and deep water, which is blue, blue circles. So uh, I'm going to unpack this data, but basically you can see right away that, you know, uh, only few prospects um, kind of are close to this one to one line, right? So most are outside. So I'm going to unpack that. So back to that workshop in, in Copenhagen, right? So we were asked, it was a pool, right? Essentially, we, people were asked in exploration volumetric, the industry is generally too optimistic, generally too pessimistic, and all about right. And most people in this case, like everybody, like 90% of people agreed that we are too optimistic in our volume assessments. What it means is, we uh, find much less volumes than we predict pre-drill. So everybody recognize that problem, right? So everybody kind of agrees with that. Here's the thing. If you look at the Mexico data set, that's not the case. That's not the case. So this is the same data set again from Norway and Netherlands and Mexico. So in Norway, from, from that period of time, right? So yeah. People found only 55% of predicted volume, so about half. Yeah. So in Netherlands, about 70%, right? So which is better. In Mexico, you know what? For 51 uh, discoveries, right, or drilled prospects, actually, it's drilled drill prospect, right? So it's on risk basis. Uh, people found 100% of what was predicted, right? So it's actually about right, right? So in general, on average, in Mexico, people were not too optimistic. That's good, right? Now, kind of, because we really need to get into the details of these assessments. 
So I'm going to show you a few comparisons of predicted uh, success case volumes and delivered volumes in different ways. Uh, but my point is, and hopefully you will see that, that even so cumulatively for 50 prospects, they got it right. Individually, for each individual prospect, it's a complete mess. So you kind of start seeing it here, right? But I'll show you it even better. So this one is um, cumulative volumes, and this is a well sequence of drilling, right? So that's what I'm talking about, right? So basically, on pre-drill assessed risk, risk mean volumes and discovered volumes, you know, after this 50, how many, three wells, right? They came to the same point, right? So that's why it's 100% in the previous table. But that only happened with the last six wells, right? So when there was 47 wells drilled, right, the volumes were about, I don't know, 60%, 70% less than predicted, right? So, and that basically tells us that we need to be very careful with this cumulative stuff um, because it depends on, it, you, need, you really need a large data set to make these type of conclusions, right? Because I'm sure as I keep, keep, keep statistics going, right, things going to change again, right? So, so basically my point is that cumulative is good, right? But we need to dig much deeper to assess the quality of pre-drill predictions. So let's look at quality of pre-drill predictions for individual prospects. So this is found, this is predicted. Now this is log-log scale, all right? So this is one to one. And this is uh, underestimated by a factor of 10, and this is overestimated by a factor of 10, all right? So if you, if what we, what we see is that most, most discoveries, right, are in this envelope of by a factor of 10, right? There are only two which are out, or three, right? Now, here's my question. Is this good enough? Because if you read old papers, right, people who do this type of work say, well, you know, by a factor of 10, that's good. No, I don't think so, really. I think that's pretty bad, right? Essentially, what we're saying is that you know, you have a prospect with 100 million barrels per drill and you find 10, which is, you know, not very untypical for Norway. And you say, well, that's kind of good. No, it's bad. It's just bad. Right. So uh, this is the same data, but in a slightly different um, representation. So it's a ratio of found to predicted recoverable resources. So essentially found and predicted right as, as a ratio. So these are all pre-drill underestimated prospects, and these are all pre-drill overestimated prospects, right? So we basically overestimate by or underestimate by a factor of, I don't know, 20 and overestimate by a factor of 60 or so. Uh, so I don't think this is a good result. Yeah, there is a correlation, some correlation, right? So basically the larger prospects pre-drill find more, yeah, but it's still a pretty poor uh, performance in my uh, in my view in my mind. Okay, um, another thing that we can uh, quickly discuss is this idea of you know high risk high reward and low risk low reward prospects. Um, because in many inventories in many inventories we see prospects which are uh, prospects that are larger that have low probability of success pre drill and prospects that are smaller have higher probability of success, which kind of makes sense, but it's more convoluted than that, right? Ideally, there should be no relationship, so I understand why it happens. But in this case, what's important is to demonstrate that pre-drill, that's kind of what the industry had, right? So average predicted pre-drill uh, was following that trend, right? So the more, more risky prospects had larger volumes, right? And uh, less risky prospects had low volumes. That's fine. Now, when you compare this found, that relationship doesn't hold, right? So these more risky prospects do not become larger ones, and larger ones become the one in the in the middle, right? And the the ones that are not much risky, they are very very small. So this is another thing for for you to consider and and and, and to look at, right? Because I haven't seen this type of uh, plots from other companies before. Now this is only discoveries, right? So because if you look only at discoveries, we can actually compare predicted volumes with, with actual results without any, any, any consideration of, of the risk, right? So average predicted is essentially a success case model. All right, so these are just some things uh, that uh, I'm, I'm actually currently working on this project, and I have a paper in review 
So hopefully I'll publish this paper, but basically that's kind of what I'm what I'm doing. So what did I learn from this? Uh, as an academic, <laughs> right, I can actually find open data and open source data on petroleum exploration because in this case, Mexico, but other governments, other people, other companies also become more transparent. We have to work to find the data and make a data set that is actually usable and defendable. Yes, but it, the data are out there, right? So, and you are inside companies, right? So for you, there is no excuse not to do this type of analysis, obviously. Now, what we learned from this Mexico data. Now, Mexico data is interesting because first it's real, right? So these are basic, I'm, I'm including wells that have been drilled, you know, last month, right? So this is a real modern new data set. It reflects uh, the current situation. It reflects the entire industry. Yeah, it's Pemex dominated, but there is 21 total number of operators behind this data set. So that's why I'm saying it's actually entire industry. Right, and it's onshore and offshore. It's a whole country. It's multiple place. So I think I think that this is reflecting reflective of what's happening right now in the industry. So what's happening? Consistent underestimation of geological probability of success values. In Mexico, it's pretty bad. Right, so pre drill they say 36 percent, and they actually have 60 percent. This is pretty bad. Right, who companies trying to kid? Right, that's a big conversation. But basically, companies consistently, consistently uh, underestimate probability of success, and as a result, make many more discoveries than they promised. Now, some people say it's a good thing. No, it's not. It's not right. So, as you, if you, if you read my papers, right, you know that I'm a big proponent of idea that just scientists are forecasters. So, it's not about discovery of the dry hole. It's how good your forecast was. Because if your forecasts are consistent, your predictions consistently good, you actually understand what you're doing. All the way from subsurface models to volumes and risk assessment and petroleum system analysis, whatever you do, right? And if your predictions are consistently bad, even if it benefits the company because you make more discoveries, well, you actually don't know what you're doing. That's that's a big difference in thinking about exploration uh, predictions. Now on 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 volumes, right? On volumes, this is was an interesting case where. On average, it kind of came, you know, 100%, right? But, you know, it was huge underestimation for some, huge overestimation for some. So basically, numerous wrong assessments made at the end everything okay, right? Obviously, it's also the wrong answer. So in my mind, we have very inaccurate assessments of success case volumes. And there are different reasons for that, right? And main ones are neglect of base rates. And second one is... Uh, poor work on column heights, <laughs> right? So uh, column heights needs to be much better constrained in volumetric models using historical data and using base rates again. But that's a different conversation. Um, all right, so that's kind of all I had to say. Uh, if you have comment, comments or questions, we can talk now. If you want to take it more private, you can always email me at mines. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's where I live. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you, Alexi, for an interesting uh, question. Uh, speak, I mean, <laughs> um, we have a few questions in the chat. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we can start with the first one. Do you consider success a well that is a discovery in another reservoir than a target? Could the difference between GPOS and actual success be explained by the unexpected lucky discoveries? Right. So that's a great question, right? So that's a great question. So, um, <laughs> and this is a tough one, right? So now let me um, let me explain this this way. So if you're inside the company, right? If you're inside the company, then basically your probability of success is for the segments, right? For the segments and then for the wells, right? Uh, after aggregation. So, and you keep these two data sets separate. Right, so if you drill a well, right, and it discovers an accumulation in a segment that you did not even envision, right, obviously for the segment that you had pre-drill, that's a failure, right? So basically you count that as a failure. Now for the well, you kind of have to say it's a success, right? So you have to count that as a success. Uh, but now if that prospect was, if, if that segment wasn't even part of your geological model, Right, so statistically, it's difficult to handle. Right, so um, 
it's kind of a caveat, right? But that's a very interesting point because it's, it happens very often, right? Not very often, but it happens often that we find accumulations not where we predicted them. And we celebrate that, right? That's good. But we have to understand that as geologists, we actually completely failed, <laughs> right? And we have to learn from that. So you need to keep that as part of your database, data set, don't hide from that fact, right? Uh, obviously collect your bonus for the discovery, but just know that your geological model was completely wrong uh, and learn from that, right? So now, so that's what I would do if, if I was inside the company, right? There's a way to keep that transparent in the database. Now for this one, for this method, for, for this data set, I have no idea, right? If these things actually happen. So are there any discoveries here in targets which were not even predicted? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Right, so basically all I see is this for well prospect assessment and then I see well prospect results, right? I don't see what's actually happening in between. There is no geology for me in this, all right? It's just, you know, exploration, exploration statistics. So, yeah, good question. Yeah, yeah I guess, I guess that's, uh, yeah, you need more inside info kind of to evaluate that properly, probably, yeah. Yep. Uh, let's see, we have more questions here. Um, do you think a country regulator should research more about this underestimation and perhaps they can construct a more specific matrix in assessing P sub S? So that's a good question, right? So that's a very good question because what's what's uh, what's important here for country reg regulator, right? So basically, I mean, take this case, right? So if, if, if this is a regulator and uh, you underestimate uh, probability of success, you're basically making more discoveries than you promise, right? To the country, to the investors, to your managers, and ultimately to the country, right? So essentially, and that's important for policy making, right? Because if you say, for example, last year, right, that you're gonna make 30 discoveries from 100 wells and you drill and you found 60, right? That's actually a different business plan for the country because if you can find more volumes, right, the country can rely more on petroleum related revenue and you know taxes and all this good stuff right so essentially you feed wrong information into your decision makers now <clears throat> you uh, on volumes it can be a different story right so but let's just talk about probability of success so uh the question was i guess should the regulator uh somehow somehow you know, enforce some kind of a better assessment system? That's a big question, right? So it's a big question. Um, the regulator definitely should work with companies to point to them that the probability of success assessments are incorrect, right? So, I mean, that should be, I mean, because regulator is in a position to actually have that information and to communicate that information back to the companies and say, hey guys, what are you doing? Right, you you basically predicted to find you know three discoveries and we making six, right? And you made six, for example, right? So uh, if it affects you know reg regulators, you know investment decisions and plans for the country and so on and so forth. But I don't think that regulators should dictate, right? What kind of risk scheme companies should have. Right. I mean, obviously it can organize and, you know, enable a conversation between the companies. Yes, but not necessarily create a scheme for them to use. Right. Because all these algorithmic uh, risk schemes in companies, it's a very hot debate. Right. Because some people hate them. Some people like them. You know, there is everybody in between. It's a very difficult thing to do. What you want to mandate is, well, fix your risk scheme. So you actually deliver what you promise, because right now, you deliver something completely different risk wise and volume wise but that's the next conversation right so that's kind of what i'm what my, my way of thinking is this so give it to the companies but point to them that if if they're doing wrong things just be transparent with them yeah so good uh, answer um see so we have uh, more here um so if you take pemex uh, major knowledge holder out of the equation would the 36 percent piece of us be more accurate? Uh, so no, yeah, yeah. So no, no, no. So basically, it, it's actually good, you know, good potential way of doing this. Just splitting Pmax from everybody else and look at this. But basically, no. From from what I, you know, 
from what I see, no, right? No. Okay. Yeah. It's it's uh, an industry problem. PM PMX is not PMX is a big influencer in this data set, but it's not it's it's not doing anything much different, right? Everybody suffers from this. Everybody. Yeah. Let's see. We have one last uh, here. Um, so, how comparable are data sets by different companies who risk differently? Um, risking minimum volume versus minimum economic volume versus mean okay. volume, etc. Right. Very and, good. And question. how much? Yeah. Very good question. I understand. So, uh, yeah. So basically, the assumption in this slide is that uh, probability of success is reported as geological probability of success. And you see what they call it in Spanish, right? Probability exito geologica, right? So geological existence. So there is no economics, right? We know that for sure, right? So this is not economical probability of success. So basically people not looking at minimum economic field size, right? That's out of the question. Now, there is a difference of opinions about what people risk or should risk on geological probability of success, presence of hydrocarbons, right? Just movable hydrocarbons irrespective of the volumes or some kind of a minimum uh, geological size, right? So if you if you know my work, I mean, most companies, most companies do presence of hydrocarbons and ExxonMobil does some minimum geological size, right? Like like 10, 10, 10 million barrels of five and they change it from play to play, right? So it's um, it's a bizarre system. Now, in this case, there is no Exxon, right? So Exxon is not an operator in Mexico. So that's a good thing uh, in terms of uh, consistency. So I'm pretty much sure that, you know, it's more or less consistent. And what people uh, risk when they assign probability of success is the presence of movable hydrocarbons, right? So, but can I guarantee that that actually happens in every case behind every well? No. So that's one of the caveats on, on, on this data set. Yes, good question. There was some more info also in that uh, question. So it's like, how much confidence do you have on the risk volume information they present publicly? I guess you answered a part of that, right? Is is it you know based so, on? So yeah. So basically, so what what they present publicly, I think, comes from the companies, mm -hmm. right? So now, and then the question is, how much you believe each company, right? So for example, right, Temex, right? What they process? I mean, everybody uses different processes. So we all know that. Right. So even inside Norway, right, even so you, you mingle a lot, right, you still use different processes and that's fine. That's what drives the competition. And that's where the fun is for this industry. Right. So um, so there is definitely lots of internal inconsistencies behind these numbers. Yes, that's inherent in, in the whole thing. Now, so what I'm doing, right, I'm basically with all these caveats that we discussed, I look up at the entire industry and highlight the main issues and the main issue is huge underestimation of probability of success, right? Huge. And what I'm also doing, I'm looking back at studies in Norway, studies in Netherlands and demonstrate that it's the same problem, right? It's 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 you know, we know that, right? So it's actually documented now and and with volumes, right? It's uh, like I said, it's not it's not the total cumulative, it's for individual prospects. You really have to dig into individual prospects and then into individual volumetric parameters, right? Which ones you actually do in most, in most cases in a wrong way, right? And which ones are actually more important. And that's why I mentioned column height, right? Because that's that solves 80% of your problem. If you if you handle co column height correctly, right? That solves your volumetric problems. I can maybe just add other, I guess, what do you think then is the best way to, to eliminate, eliminate this under, under bias? Do you have a <laughs> underestimation? On, I would say. on probability of success or on volumes? Uh, probability of success. So, right, so on probability of success, right, where the issues are, there are several issues, right? One of them is in how we do this, right? So basically we take risk factors, right? Four, five, six, whatever you have, and then multiply them together, right? And that's where the first problem lies, because as soon as you start multiplying things, right, uh, the total probability of success gets smaller if you don't use a lot of ones and 0.95s and 0.9s, right? And our mind, geological minds, usually don't go in that direction, right? So usually people say, well, no, you can never say there is a 100% of reservoir. And that's where the problem is, right? Because if you, 
basically voicing up your opinion that you can never say there is a hundred percent probability for reservoir. Well, you know what? It's just your opinion. Right now, what you have to say is we looked in this place surrounding this new prospect, right? And all wells that penetrated this play, this interval, this Jurassic sandstones, right, found the reservoir. All wells found the reservoir, and that's why I suggest for the next prospect it's going to be 100% uh, on, on reservoir, right? So you see the difference, right? So you basically have to use data and base rates and information when you uh, formulate in your probability of success on specific risk factors, right? And most people don't go there, right? Most people just basically arguing about, well, it can never be 100%. Well, it can. Yeah, too much like 0.995 maybe. Right. Yeah. Exactly, right? So exactly. So and they start, start arguing about this, you know, and that's how mathematically you end up with low probability of success. Now, the thing is, your manager, right, when he actually or she sees these numbers, can use statistical base rates as we just discussed, right? So let's say you have a portfolio in in um, in uh, in Norway, which you do, right? And you propose to drill ten wells next year, and your probability of success for these ten wells is thirty five percent average, right? Now you look at your historical drilling for your company in the last two years, and you know what your probability of success was sixty percent, clearly. Which in, I think in Norway on average is about fifty now, right? So clearly your assessment is wrong. And then you can start unpacking where your assessment actually goes wrong, right? And you can do it on individual risk factors by doing post-drill analysis and seeing which ones actually fail, which ones become successful on individual risk factors, right? So it's you basically address the process. The problem is in the process that you have. But the first thing that you need to see is first what you actually deliver versus what you predicted, like, like I just said, right? So you look at 2021, if you participated, your company participated in 10 wells, you look at the pre-drill probability of success average, if it was 35%, but you actually made 50% success rate, well, you have a gap, which you need to close, because you basically are in this problem of uh, underestimating the probability of success. Now, where is the problem? You have to look back into each assessment, right? And see what exactly was what, what exactly what was going on, right? It can be as simple as, for example, you always always uh, overestimate the sandstones, right? The presence of the reservoirs or um, the quality of the reservoirs, right? The deliverability, whatever it is, right? You can start looking back at your failure modes, which we'll talk about tomorrow, hopefully, right? And and figure this out. So mm -hmm. it's a relatively simple uh, process, and it's relatively easy to fix. The problem is people, yeah, <laughs> it's psychology, yeah, yeah. right? It's the biases, it's the psychology. It's um, it's um, it's very difficult to instill a process into people. And I was in this position, right, in my companies where I create the process and say, hey, that's the way we go. And, you know, some people fight, some people do, you know, and then I leave and everything goes back to the way things were done before. So that's where that's where, you know, the problem is. Right, essentially, because because remember, risk doesn't exist. Risk is in our head, right? We cannot measure the risk, right? We just make it up. So as soon as you are doing something that doesn't exist, actually, and you just talk about this and you make it up, right? It it, it becomes a problematic. It gives a lot of open uh, situation for people's opinions and hierarchy and you know all these good things. So which we love about geology, but also kind of hate at the end because you know the results not necessarily what we what we think is going to be yeah no definitely it's a very interesting psychological aspect to it all yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah the risk is about, we, is about psychology. Uh, yeah. sorry the risk is about psychology right so you have to you have to remove personal judgment and psychology from your risking scheme and that's why i have these risk papers uh risk tables paper right which many of you have seen Right, so that was an attempt to reduce the bias and to remove, you know, people bias from from the process as much as possible, right? Mm -hmm. So and and companies who applied my tables or something like that told me that it actually works. So if you haven't tried it or haven't seen it, you know, give it give it a thought. 
All right, I think that's uh, we have, we don't have any more uh, questions. So uh, I would like to thank you again for a very interesting presentation and uh, for all of you attending so late. Uh, uh, and then uh, we will see you all tomorrow at uh, nine thirty, and we look forward to your next presentation as well, uh, Alexei. Sure. Thanks.